Hello, everyone. So in this video, uh, we'll talk about uh, Heraclitus's account of the Logos, which is a very, very important concept that we can draw from his collected fragments. Now, what does Logos mean? So if you type it in a Greek dictionary, you will have like many different meanings. You know, the common uses where it meant a story, narrative, it could mean history, any kind of account or discourse, explanation. It could also mean news. You know, it could mean, you know, a speech. Uh, somebody gave a logos, somebody gave a speech, somebody um, told me the logos, gave me an account, gave me a narrative, news. Um, any kind of talk or conversation, you know, logos between two people is a talk or conversation between two people. It could be just a rumor, you know, the logos that I heard, the, you know, the rumor that I heard. Uh, it could mean uh, sort of any kind of proverbial saying, you know, the, there's an ancient logos that says kind of a thing. Um, it could it could just mean word, right? So like the uh, beginning of the Bible, um, the, the Old Testament, you have um, in the beginning was the logos. You know, in the beginning was the word. It just mean word. Uh, it could mean um, sometimes it could mean treaty or agreement even. You know, um, it could mean a, a, a written work. It could mean a section of a written work. Um, that, that those are sort of one kind of meaning, which means account and stuff. Then you have another kind of meaning, which means thought, reasoning, you know, all these things. So from where you have the word, for example, logic, right? So the idea of thinking. And uh, you have um, another meaning, which is um, logos could mean sort of, you know, argument or cause or pretext, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, it could also mean sort of measure. So that's one of the uses that Heraclitus has, actually, uh, to mean measure. It could mean proportion, relation. Um, it could also, very importantly, mean a general rule or a principle, right? It could mean the faculty of reason. And it could mean uh, something like a definition or a formula. So you know, like as you can see, there's so many meanings of logos. Now. Um, what we will try to do is, when we talk about logos, is to see what he would mean in one particular case or not. Uh, generally, Heraclitus uses it in first a general sense. So he uses it as something like, which is an account, something which one hears, uh, something, um, you know, uh, sometimes he means it as a statement that is independent of the one who is speaking it. So in, the, in fragment one, which I had quoted earlier, where he says, you know, although this logos holds forever, you know, there's this statement, this, this, this idea, this whatever principle, in this case probably principle, holds forever. Um, so, so something that um, could also mean a truth or an, an understanding, an intelligence, an insight, really, which could uh, which could hold for everybody, which is common to everybody, and uh, something which. Um, uh, because, can be a universal law, really, a, a regulation, something that regulates everything, so a kind of universal law of everything. So, you know, with Heraclitus, despite the fact that there is, uh, you know, his fragments, as you saw, uh, like, uh, very sort of suggestive and very fragmentary, um, we can still sort of, you know, try and find this consistent sort of understanding of his uh, perspective, of his worldview, uh, from... Um, from his text. But of course, you know, the more commentaries you read, you'd have different sort of understandings. So you have one, this one, the Kirk and Ravens, the textbook. If you're interested particularly in Heraclitus, you can go to um, this one, uh, Khan, who has, uh, you know, all the fragments and a very brilliant commentary on them. Uh, there are more books. Uh, you can go to Guthrie, History of Greek Philosophy. So, so you have a lot of texts out here for, um, uh, with the different sort of Markovich is one of the famous ones who, who has uh, the fragments and a very good commentary on them. So, so you can go and look at you know many different commentaries uh, on Heraclitus, and you will see that um, they people have different takes, let's say, but more or less everybody is able to draw some kind of a coherent worldview from from it. So you know there is some kind of coherence which can be drawn. So. We started with fragment one, and I already sort of like read it out last time, but I shall do it again, where he talks about logos. And the idea of logos here is something, it's both a general law principle and also something that is held in common, you know, a common insight and an account, right? An account of some sort. So he says, 
although this logos holds forever, men ever fail to comprehend, both before hearing it and once they've heard, right? It's not something that is immediately apparent to people. Uh, although all things come to pass in accordance with this logos, men are like the untried when they try such words and works, as I set forth. And he, as I said, he writes it as an introduction to his book. He's like, they don't get it, you know, whatever I say. Uh, distinguish, di distinguishing each according to its nature and telling how it is. So I am explaining everything, but they don't get it. But other men are oblivious of what they do awake, just as they're forgetful of what they do asleep. And this awake asleep distinction as well plays a very important part out here. So this idea that uh, when you're awake, you share this common world, right? So, so you have a common logos, you have a common understanding, but when you, when you sleep, you, you are dreaming, you're turning away to a world of your own. And he said that, um, and I'll find that uh, fragment as well and read it out to you. So, you know, th those sleeping turn to a world of their own. Those awake, you know, share in the common world. Although he also has a fragment where he says, um, uh, even those sleeping are sort of, you know, com laborers for the common. So they're also sort of adding to the knowledge of the world. But you, you have a private understanding, while this logos is something that is held in common. So there are people, if they turn, if they turn to their own world as if they are asleep, you know, so it's like, oh, this is, this is what I see, this is my perspective, and this is what I would understand, rather than trying to see, you know, to grasp if there is something that I can understand in common with others. So, um, uh, this is what he's criticizing out here. So he has another fragment where he says, it is wise um, listening not to me, don't listen to me. And as I said this, you know, this half modesty and half arrogance that you can see in his style. Listening not to me, but to the logos, you know, listen to the logos, listen to the account, listen to the common principle, you know, uh, and agree that all things are one. Yeah, don't listen to me, but listen to the logos and agree that all things are one. And um, the idea that it is a virtue, really, to grasp what is common, um, and it is a fault to lay claim to a knowledge of your own. So this idea of, you know, um, that, that most people are oblivious to, um, to what they do when they are awake. You know, they're, they're acting as if they're still asleep. They're sleepwalkers in this world. And um, you have another one where he says, um, this is the fr uh, second fragment, fragment two, where he says, although the logos is shared, although the sort of, you know, account is shared, most men live as though the thinking were a private possession. So this, this very, very sharp, precise critique, you know, your thinking is not your own private possession. It's, a, it's something that is held in common and you are, you know, turning away to a world of your own and thinking this is my private understanding. It's not about private understanding. It's, it's sort of common understanding. And then another one where he says, fragment 17, most men do not think things in the way they encounter them, nor do they recognize what they experience, but believe in their own opinions, right? Again, you know, like instead of like trying to grasp the world and to grasp the world in a way which could be understood by people around you, you know, people are turning to their own opinions. They're like, oh, no, my, in my opinion, this is what is true. So, you know, like refusing to believe in a common sort of truth, a truth that can be grasped by everybody. So um, fragment 72, where he says, the truth lies there for all to see, but they are at odds with that with which they most commonly associate. And what they meet with every day uh, seems strange to them. So again, these people, these sleepwalkers, these sleepers, um, who, um, you know, the, the, the truth is manifest, but they, are, they treat it as a private possess possession, and they just want to have their own opinions and not have, you know, not try to even, you know, reach to this truth, this logos, the common logos of all. And uh, so he gives a, a, a sort of, you know, dictum which he, in which he says, we should not act and speak like men asleep, right? We should not act and sleep, uh, speak as if, you know, uh, we are isolated with our own opinion, which, you know, is our own and uh, our belief and our doxa, really, and other people cannot share in it, you know, this special private understanding. So uh, basically the idea is that the person who has the insight into the common, you know, the metaphor out here of awake, asleep, you know, sharing in the common world and dreaming and turning to their own private possession is that the person uh, with the insight into the common sort of, you know, logos, common account is somebody who is awake, right? Because the world, he says, is, is waking, the world of the waking is one and shared 
and the sleeping turn, each turn to the world of their own, you know, the fragment that I was quoting earlier. Uh, so, so there's a shared sort of awake sort of world and the sleeping turn to a world of their own. And um, those who are sleeping, even when they look like they're awake, they're basically, you know, uh, behaving as if they are asleep. So he says, um, when in the first fragment where he says, you know, other men are oblivious of what they do when they are awake, as they are forgetful of what they do when they're asleep. That's what he's precisely saying, that um, people are turning towards their own private understanding, their own private sort of viewpoint. Um, and, and so here, from here, we can also try and see if he has some kind of a theory of perception, you know? Like, in fact, the, the question is, uh, I answered an epistemological question of how do we know that what we perceive, whether anything that we perceive, it is true, right? We know that if other people corroborate this perception, I mean, how else can we know? In fact, uh, Descartes later on had this problem in which he did not believe at all in you know, this, this whole business where he was like, um, how do I know that when I look out of the window and I see all these people walking and their hats and this thing, how do I know that they're people? How do I know that they have their own minds? They might just be uh, other sort of automatons. Or how do I you know, know that I'm even awake? In fact, that was his question, he says in Meditation 1, that how do I know that I'm even sort of um, awake right now and not sleeping? Because I've often found myself you know, thinking that I've done all this, and then I find myself, you know, I suddenly wake up and I find myself on this sort of chair. Uh, by the fire. So, so this question is a question of, in the history of philosophy, a history of, um, you know, in, in the history of epistemology, really, uh, where the question of how do I know whether what I perceive is true? And the answer that I think we can draw from all these fragments of Heraclitus is that he's saying that the, the, the true knowledge is something that is held in common. If it is just your own private understanding, so when Descartes sort of talks about um, these sleepers or these uh, drunk people, and he says, um, you know, people who are mad, who, let's say I believe that I'm Napoleon, like, but nobody else is confirming this for me, then I'm probably not Napoleon, right? Um, then I'm somebody else. Um, so, uh, so this idea of corroboration from others, you know, is, is something that Heraclitus is sort of uh, bringing forward out here. So, um, if, the, the, to give you a few more fragments where he talks about this logos as being something that is common to all, he says, um, there's fragment 113 where he says, thinking is common to all, right? Everybody thinks. And um, uh, fragment 116, where he says, all people have a share in knowing themselves and being sensible. So, so in the first video, when we talked about him being slightly anti-democratic, where he says, you know, one person is one ten thousand for me if he is the best kind of a thing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, everybody has capability of thought. Everybody, you know, can participate in thinking. Everybody has a share of thinking. Everybody has a share of logos. But it's just that, you know, the hoi polloi sort of turn to a world of their own. They act as if you know everything is their own particular opinion and they don't share in this logo so in fact um, is he really being anti-democratic out there in the in the strict sense of the term you know what he's I think what he's saying more likely I'm giving him the benefit of doubt out here I think what he's saying is that uh, you know, most people turn to their sort of common opinions and they want to just listen to themselves speaking to themselves and they, they are in a, in a dream world of their own. And that's why they don't understand what I'm saying and they're not going to understand what I'm saying because they are not ready to sort of step out of their private possessions, you know, the, the uh, understanding that thinking is a private possession. If they stepped out and they believed that thinking was not a private possession, then they would, you know, participate in this common thinking, this common, lo common logos that all of us have. So I think he is, um, uh, you know, making a more radical claim than simply that, you know, uh, that there are some people who are Aristos, who are the best, like Hermodorus, you know, and everybody else is kakoi, or bad, or evil, or worthless. So I think, I think it's a much more subtle sort of understanding that we can draw from Heraclitus. But as I say, you know, you can go one way or another. These are still just fragments. So different commentators come up with different sort of understandings of this. This is how I would read it. So um, then he says, 
thinking well is the greatest excellence, to act and speak what is true, perceive, perceiving things according to their nature, right? So, so w what does Aristos actually even mean? It means, you know, thinking well, you know, thinking properly. And as, as I said, you know, again, this, this idea of don't turn to your opinions, don't turn to your particular beliefs or to your private sort of understanding. Try and participate in the common because the common belongs to everybody, yeah? So it's an important point out here. Then the other understanding of logos that we already talked about, but you know, and I'll go a bit more in depth and give you a few fragments as well, is the idea of logos as the unifying law. Yeah, logos as this unifying law that that uh, connects everything. So he says, fragment one one four. He says, it is necessary for those speaking with sense to put firm trust in what is common to all, as a city does. In, in the law, and much more firmly. For all human laws are nourished by the one, one divine law, for it rules as much as it wishes, and it is insufficient for all, and remains over and, oh, sorry, it is sufficient for all, and it remains over and above. Right, so this, this idea that there is this one divine law which regulates everything, Right, and uh, just like we put our trust in the laws of the city, why do we put our trust in the laws of the city? Because we think that you know the city will hold only the police will only hold if everybody sort of you know trusts in this law. And he has a few fragments which I've probably not quoted out here, but where he talks about you know um, just like you defend the gates of the city, you should defend this law. Um, sort of an idea. So uh, you should put firm trust in this law because this is what will protect you. And this is what sort of, you know, is common to all. And, and it's beyond just the city. The city has its own particular city laws, but this logos is common to everybody. Yeah. Uh, then another fragment where he says, uh, okay, this one is a bit of a more subtle fragment which I am putting out here, but other commentators might put it in cosmology or somewhere else, where he says, the beginning and the end are shared in the circumference of a circle, right? And uh, he might just be talking about the, a circle, you know, some kind of a mathematical thing, but he's not really sort of keen on talking about mathematics per se, you know, from his other fragments. And I think personally that here he's talking about the logos. That you know the logos is is where it begins and the logos is where it ends, a kind of logos RK kind of a thing. And we'll talk about whether logos can count as an RK for him. But but the idea that the, the, there is a not just a cyclical but a circular sort of uh, understanding of logos in which um, the beginning and the end is the same. You know you you will not find a beginning or an end to this logos. And I'm putting it in the logos. You can put it somewhere else. The same fragment. But the, the both the beginning and the end are in this uh, one logos, which, which contains everything. And remember, no matter if you travel the whole road of your life, you will still not reach the end. Why not? Because there is no end. You know, the beginning is the end for, for this logos. Then um, logos then is also understood as um, both as human thought and as the governing principle of the universe. So human thought, we talked about thinking in the previous sort of section, um, but also as the governing principle of the universe in the sense that it is universal, as I said, beginning and end both together. It is all pervading. It is the law by which the world is ordered and uh, it, it can be comprehended by us, but you know, because it is common to all of us, but probably not entirely because there's such a deep logos to life, for example, he says, um, that um, it, 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 it sort of um, governs everything. In fact, he has this, um, these statements which are taken as meaning, you know, statements about the logos in which he talks about logos guiding everything. He says, the thunderbolt steers all things. Now this thunderbolt, you know, makes you think of Zeus, but he's not pre precisely talking about Zeus at all. Um, the, 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 the metaphor is there, but the metaphor then carries into this idea of, and, and later we'll talk about fire as well, you know, logos as fire. Um, this idea that sort of com comes up and which makes him makes people count him amongst the materialist monists, which I don't think he is. Uh, but um, there, there is some sort of argument to be made for him being a materialist monist who believes that everything is fire. Um, but he, rather than say that, what he's saying is that the thunderbolt guides all things. So there is one law, you know, the law, which is the logos, which guides everything, which steers everything. And uh, um, he says, the wise is one, 
uh, knowing the plan by which it steers all things through all. Again, there is this one wisdom, this one sophos, I think he says, or sophon. I, I don't remember the exact Greek in there. So, so um, th this idea of there's this one wise thing, one wise person, sophon, you know, like, uh, anyway, so um, which, um, which guides everything, which steers everything. Um, then, um, Another one where he says that um, human nature does not have any set purpose, yeah? Because we are living that, this life and we are, in fact, very confused and we don't know, we, we turn to our dreams half the time. But the divine has, you know, the logos has. What it is, I don't know, because it goes in a circle and it closes in itself. But it has some purpose and so that means that there is an account a logos that steers everything, that, that makes everything function the way it functions. So, um, then the question arises about how do we grasp this common truth? If we humans are capable at all of grasping it, then how do we grasp it? So the answer that we can get from some of his fragments is that we can uh, grasp it first by going beyond our sort of private world, you know, so basically going beyond our individual disconnected sort of senses and uh, drawing conclusion from the common. How do we draw conclusions from the common? By reflection, by intuition, you know, something that, that we can intuit as, being, as belonging to all, something that we can reflect upon and understand as belonging to all, rather than you know, turning to our own opinions. So that's one way. Uh, what use our senses, you know, our, our sort of, um, you know, sight and ears and everything. So he says that senses are necessary. He says, uh, whatever comes from sight, hearing, learning from experience, these I prefer. So the idea that he, he does trust in the senses, but then eyes are sure of witnesses and ears. You know, there is there's some kind of a hierarchy out there. Um, because they, they, they do bring us in contact with the logos. You know, eventually the common logos, how do we access it? We access it through our senses. So the senses are necessary. But we need to still be wary of them, right? They're deceptive because he says, Eyes and ears are poor witnesses uh, for men if their souls do not understand the language. In fact, the word he uses there is barbarous, right? This idea of barbarous souls, the soul that does barbar, right? The, the soul that sort of speaks nonsense. Um, so the idea that, you know, let's say if your if your soul speaks nonsense, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't understand language, if it doesn't have a capability of understanding language, then, then even if your eyes and ears and the whole world are giving you all kinds of information, you don't understand it, right? Because let's say you go to a foreign country and everybody is speaking. And you can hear it, right? You can hear what they're saying and you can see what they're doing. But if you don't understand their language, you know, if you're, you're then, then how will you, like you don't know what they're saying then, you know, they could be talking absolutely, they could be saying absolutely anything and you would not get anything. So, so this idea of senses can be deceptive if your soul doesn't have understanding, right? Then you have uh, the, the, the idea that not comprehending this is another fragment, they hear like the deaf. The saying is their witness, absent while present, right? The saying is their witness, sorry, absent while present. So this idea that, um, again, the same idea that when, if you don't understand what is being told to you, if, you're, if, you, if you don't have, um, you know, without, without understanding, without true understanding, you know, you're, you're barely, you're, there's minimum participation in, you know, wakeful life. You're basically turning to your sleep. You're, you're dreaming. Um, and you understand bare minimum of what is being said around you because you're absent while present. You know, you might be present there. You might be in a, let's say you go to a colloquium where people are talking, you're present, you know, you are there and people are saying some very, very interesting things. Let's say you have gone to this conference for um, quantum mechanics and, uh, you know, you sit there, you listen to everything, but you don't understand anything. Then, you know, you're absent while present. You know, what do you understand? Like, you don't really get what is being said out here. So, um, so you can see this idea of logos, you know, and then you can. See, I, I hope that this is now getting more clear in your mind, you know, what what he means by this logos, you know, and and why is it so important? And, um, there are certain fragments which I feel are a bit more sort of confusing, uh, where he then uh, talks about this material aspect of logos, and and he it could 
be just a very elaborate metaphor for all the things that we have just talked about, but we sh still should mention it, where um, the material aspect of logos is fire. So, uh, excuse me, I already quoted that one where he says the thunderbolt steers all things. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so, so the idea that uh, there is this thunderbolt which acts as a logos which steers everything. Yeah. Then um, you have another one where um, uh, he says uh, fire coming on will discern and catch up with all things. You know, again, this idea of this fire which will come on and discern and catch up with all things. And in fact, um, the Stoics, you know, take it further to um, come up with this idea of ekpyrosis, the idea that the whole world will go up in this whole conflagration of fire and uh, start anew. And uh, it's believed that the Stoics, you know, picked it up from Heraclitus, uh, this idea of uh, fire being so important and being this, the, the world sort of going up in this conflagration of fire, this ekpyrosis that um, is talked about. So he says, another one which I really like, you know, he says, how will one hide from that which never sets? And it makes me think of the Eye of Sauron in Lord of the Rings, where, you know, there's this thing that never sets, but I suppose it's the Logos in this case, it's a bit scary though. <laughs> where he says that um, how can we actually sort of um, <coughs> hide from, you know, this logos? This logos tears everything. And, and then, then it never sets also gives me the idea of the sun, you know, but the sun sets for him. It's, it's pretty interesting. We'll, when we'll get to the cosmology, he talks about the sun, which um, is renewed every day. You know, it sets in water, it like you know, dissolves in a new sun every day. So uh, what is this fire? So he talks about this fire as this pure divine reason. You know, this idea of fire as being something that is hot and dry, if you want to think in an Aximander's terms of opposites, um, the, which is this kind of a dry exhalation, this, this dry soul. Um, and and um, we have a, um, a testimony, I think, where he says the soul is an ex exhalation that perceives it is different from the body and always flowing. I think it's from Aristotle where he talks about Heraclitus' soul and he says it's, for him it's this kind of a dry exhalation which um, is different from the body and always flowing. I don't know what to make of it, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's again this logos. And then you have one where he says, um, a gleam of light is the dry soul, wisest and best. Now again, there's this idea of the dry soul. And remember that, that sort of in the pre uh, previous sort of video, we talked about uh, Heraclitus' death. So apparently he got dropsy and then he tried to dry himself. So I think some of the joke uh, is, is from the same idea of um, him talking about this dry soul being best. So he's just like, oh, I, I sh I'll get better if I get dry in some way, you know, to make dr drought out of rainwater. Um, then th he has this idea that foolishness, you know, that, that idiocy is, is cold and damp, you know, so wisdom and uh, what is wise and best is dry uh, and hot. Then uh, what is sort of, you know, um, idiotic and, you know, terrible, uh, kakos, is uh, cold and damp. So he says, a man when drunk uh, is led by a beardless boy, stumbling, not perceiving where he's going, having his soul moist, right? So he's drunk, which means that his soul is moist. And so now he's being led by this boy who has not reached, yet reached his adulthood. And um, he does not perceive where he's going. So it's a drunk person is somebody who, who um, does not perceive where he's going, of course. Um, but he also has a moist soul. Yeah? So the idea of dry soul is when you perceive everything clearly and you understand. And a moist soul is when you're roaming about a bit drunk. Uh, then another one where he says, it is death to souls to become water. Death to water to become earth, and uh, earth comes from water from water soul. So we'll, we'll leave that. But this idea of it's death to souls to become water, right? Now, this also gives us an idea of soul being something like fire. Because then again, you have this idea of um, a fiery thing on which you pour water, it will well, go, out, go out. So uh, again, this, this fragment can be taken as perhaps sort of indicating that for him, the soul was something that was fiery, like fire-like. And so if you pour drink on it, you get drunk, then uh, yeah, your soul becomes moist and dead, really. Yeah. So he says another one. Um, the ordering, the same for all, no God nor man has made, 
but it ever was and will be, fire ever living, kindled in measures and in measures going out. Now, this is a pretty interesting fragment because in this, what's happening with fire is that it's a, it's a balancing factor. If you think of it in sort of an Anaximander's terms of like, let's say, the opposite, the aperon, the, the fire is like this kind of a balancing thing. In fact, you know, the next fragment where he says, uh, fragment 90, where he says, all things are requital for fire and fire for all things, as goods for gold and gold for goods. You know, this idea of just as uh, gold can be used to exchange goods, you know, you can, uh, you don't need to sort of, uh, I mean, how do you exchange, let's say, um, a bag of rice with, uh, I don't know, um, with bricks or something. So, so uh, I mean, earlier you had the barter system, but uh, later you had the idea that this is worth this much gold and this is worth this much gold. So in the same way as gold can act as an exchange, a, a common factor, which can be used to exchange uh, different things, in the same way, fire, uh, can be sort of you know used as something that um, can be used for exchange, and then this fire is something that is always was, ever will be. It is ever living, everlasting, and it is kindled in measures and uh, goes out in measures. So it, it, it's what sort of you know bal is balanced throughout the universe. So again, this idea of fire as being uh, you know something like a logos, you know, a measure in that sense. So. One question that you know will arise out here is: Was Heraclitus a monist? You know, well, it's not clear whether he was a monist in the you know Ionian sense, in the sense of the Milesians. You know, like is fire uh, really like air or water? Not quite, because it's not fire being sort of um, in that sense the RK in the same way as we talked about it in in those videos uh, and and with those thinkers. Um, it's not. Um, it's not something that, you know, like with an axiomon is, you know, transforms into different things. It's basically, it's more like an, uh, a balancing factor uh, between different things. So, um, but we could count logos as an archae of sorts. As I said, you know, the circle without beginning and without end. You know, this, this, this sort of ar logos as archae, which, which begins everything, which rules everything and rules till the end. But not exactly, and you know, and it's very difficult to figure out his cosmology, cosmogony, even his idea of the constitution of the world. You know, is it separate from the logos, or is it logos itself? Very difficult to tell. So I'm not sure whether he can be counted as a monist in that sense, but he can be counted as a monist in the sense of one single principle. Remember, one one wise uh, thing, one god, one you know, all kinds of things. So monist in the, that that sense of like, you know, there's a single sort of entity that controls everything. Um, so to summarize, you know, um, logos that we've talked about, we, we have logos as this um, everlasting truth, this independent truth, which is independent of our utterance of it. You know, it existed before us, it'll exist after us, it existed before Heraclitus, after Heraclitus. Heraclitus is just one amongst many, like the Sibyl through whom this eternal God is speaking, you know, and also usually signaling, not even speaking, not, neither speaking nor concealing kind of a thing, right? Um, it's also, in that sense, the divine intelligent principle which surrounds us, which um, which orders the cosmos, really. You know, the cosmos exists because of this logos, which steers everything. Uh, it's also thinking, right? It's that within us, you know, which which sort of allows us any kind of thinking, any kind of intelligence, and it is something that we hold in common. You know, that intelligence only means anything because we hold it in common. You know, we all have that same discourse. In fact, um, you could take it very far and um, apply Heraclitus to the later um, psychoanalysts and, and this idea of uh, language, you know, the, everything is structured like a language and conscious is structured like a language, as Lacan would say. So, so the, this idea that, you know, like we are the discourse of others, you know, nous les discours des autres, we are the discourse of others, we are the discourse of, we are, we are a common discourse. So this is discourse held in common again. Then um, finally, this, this logos, sort of either as a metaphor, you know, fire as a metaphor for logos, or logos as materially fire, which is hot and dry and not cold and moist. And, you know, it, 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 it in our soul, our soul also, by the way, as logos, you know, our soul is logos. That's what gives us that common insight and intelligence. But um, this, this soul which can go 
wet <laughs> uh, when drunk, for example. So that's what that's what happens, and that's that's why we don't have you know that good an understanding when we are we are drunk. So we we have a moist soul, you know, or presumably when we are sleeping as well. So yeah, uh, Leros, as I said, pretty important for Heraclitus and. Um, have a look at the fragments. I will also talk about it in the interactive sessions, and we'll go through them, you know, in a different way. Um, but the, this sort of combines everything together, like the idea of everything together. And then now, in the next video, we'll talk about one of the most important aspects of uh, Heraclitus's sort of thought. The other more most important, um, apart from logos, is the idea of uh, harmony of opposites and flux. You know, change. How do how how does he understand change? Thank you.